Hey out there, today is Monday, May 10th, 2021. Coming up on the show today, from Bohemian Rhapsody, editor John Ottman. And then when I realized the scene was really coming together and was going to be great, I was already pissed off because I assumed someone's going to wreck it. Supervising dialogue and ADR editor, Nina Hartstone. Because it's a musical film, I got to cut the vocals as well, which Freddie's vocal on its own, I'll never get over that. Supervising sound editor, John Warhurst. Now, if you ever hear Queen playing We Will Rock You Live, you'll always hear them playing it much faster than they ever play it in the movie. And re-recording mixer, Paul Massey. That was Brian May's idea. He wanted to re-record the Fox logo. He ended up using 64 different guitars. All that and a lot more on this episode of The Rough Cut. Okay, welcome once again to that podcast we call The Rough Cut. No, we did not drop into a time loop back into 2018. Although that does sound nice right now. But yes, today's podcast is on the Oscar-winning biopic about Queen and their legendary frontman Freddie Mercury. And the question really isn't why Bohemian Rhapsody, but why now? Well, first, I recently received a message from a listener. Yes, I have listeners. You're listening. That counts. And this listener said, hey, I've heard you mention that the rough cut actually started back in 2005. Do you have any older episodes to which you could, you know, point me? And not to go into the whole history of the show and why it's been a solo effort since I rebooted it. But most older episodes are gone, and I have no idea where they are. But I do have a handful of them lying around here and there. So I started to think that maybe it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world to repost older episodes. You know, the information and the insight you get from the guests is kind of evergreen. It doesn't always matter what version of Media Composer they used or how fast their hard drives were. Editing is pretty much editing, and the same can be said for the sound team components as well. So there's that reason. It gave me some encouragement to be okay with posting older content. Second, about a month ago, I did a podcast on Godzilla vs. Kong with editor Josh Schaefer, and in that one, he mentioned having editor John Ottman help out with some consulting on that film. Well, wouldn't you know it, John Ottman is the editor, Oscar-winning editor of Bohemian Rhapsody, and on top of that, he's also a composer, which I find amazing. And above all else, he's a ton of fun to talk to about editing, so I should do all I can to get him in front of as many people as possible. And the final reason for going back into the archives and posting this Bohemian Rhapsody episode is that I am feeling overwhelmingly nostalgic for talking about editing and filmmaking in front of real live people. I mean, podcasts are great. I love making this one, and I hope you enjoy listening to it. But there's nothing like having these same discussions in front of a crowd, on a stage, with a giant high-res screen behind you showing the movie and the media composer and the Pro Tools interfaces, and with a massive Dolby Atmos surround system. And the last time I got to do something like that was two years ago in Las Vegas at the NAB convention. And it was with the sound and picture post team from Bohemian Rhapsody. The aforementioned John Ottman as well as the Oscar-winning trio of supervising dialogue and ADR editor Nina Hartstone, supervising sound editor John Werhurst, and re-recording mixer Paul Massey. It was just the most fun you could possibly have, even in Vegas. And considering the source material we were showing and listening to, it was pretty close to being on stage with Queen in terms of the spectacle of it all. I loved every minute of it, and as we always do, we recorded those sessions. Now, there's no way I can really recreate everything from that presentation in podcast form, but I think I've done as good a job as possible of stripping it down to something that is still really enjoyable and educational for you, the listener. The first half of this podcast is with editor John Ottman, and in a lot of the discussion with him, we're talking about two montage sequences from the film. One is the Fat Bottom Girls sequence where John brilliantly balances concert footage and clips of the band on the road against quieter elements of Freddie talking to his fiancée Mary back home in England and letting the audience see that Freddie might not be able to deny his true sexuality much longer in this new world. That sequence is what we talk about the most because, as I just explained it, it actually drives the narrative of the film. Whereas the other sequence we talk about, A Tour of Japan, ultimately gets shortened and moved around in the film because it failed to do just that, drive the narrative. And I think you'll be able to follow along with all that as you're listening. That talk with John is then followed by a discussion with Paul, Nina, and John Warhurst from the sound team. I think that one is pretty self-explanatory as well. You don't get to hear a lot of concert stuff, which was a blast when we were there live, But I think a little bit of the Live Aid section actually sneaks in there. So enjoy that. Enjoy all of it. They were awesome, and the images, sounds, and music they put together were all amazing. Speaking of, it's that time again to talk about amazing music. Wouldn't you like amazing music in your film too? Well, you can. Just visit our friends and sponsor Extreme Music. Since 1997, they've been helping film and TV makers sound their best with music from top-shelf talent, some of the biggest names in film composing, producing, and music making. Names like Hans Zimmer, Quincy Jones, Timbaland, and Snoop Dogg. They have brought all that music together into an easy-to-use website where you can search by genre, tempo, lyrics, all kinds of keywords, and Extreme Music will help you find just what you're looking for. 
And when you find it, they help you license it right there online. All so simple, so fun. And of course, if you would like that human interaction that we've all been lacking lately, they have representatives in offices all over the world that can advise you on the process. So the next time you're looking for the best production audio for your soon-to-be award-winning film or TV show, visit ExtremeMusic.com. All right, on with the show. Set the Wayback Machine for April 2019, Destination Las Vegas, Nevada. From Bohemian Rhapsody, here are Oscar winners John Ottman, Nina Hartstone, John Warhurst, and Paul Massey. questions in the past two days. I yeah. keep like, what can I ask him that I haven't asked him already? Where is the Oscar? Oh, it's in, uh, it's on a shelf in a little screening room I have at my house. No. Yeah, off in a dark corner, actually. <laughs> okay, so let's get back to the beginning. How you got in this project? This is a huge project. You've done a lot of big movies in your career. Mm-hmm. Even early on, yeah, Usual Suspects was a pretty big movie for a young editor. And now Bohemian Rhapsody, just a monster film. How did you get onto this film? Well, it's funny. Usual Suspects was like a tiny little film at the time, you know, and then it became like a cultural or a little, um, what do you call it, um, cult cult movie, you know. A little sleeper. It became bigger, you know. Uh, and this one was sort of the same, but in a bigger way. It was a smaller budgeted film, like it was supposed to be like a 50, 50 60 million dollar movie. So, um, and it just became massive. But um, how I got on, I'm just basically part of the automatic equation when Brian Singer would do a film and uh, as the editor and the composer. So I was supposed to do both on this. And uh, I, I initially said, I'm never going to do this again because uh, uh, the editing and the composing thing is so horrible for my personal life and my health, because uh, after X-Men Apocalypse, I, I lost like 25 pounds, so I said I just can't do it anymore. It's uh, I'm not the old young guy I used to be, so, uh, but then he, but then Bo Rap came along. I'm like, how do you say no to that? So um, I did it, but then, then three quarters of the way through making the film, I realized that uh, a film score wouldn't be right for the film, so I used opera for when Freddie was alone in his house, or used the tracks from Queen, took out the vocal track, and like scored scored scenes with uh, the Queen music, so um, that kept it pure and timeless. So uh, as a film composer, I say, even if I put film music in, it would have been like a movie of the week or something. So um, this, this kept it, I think, something classic, you know. All of our focus has been on your skills and your history as an editor, but the composer part is really compelling and really interesting and unique. Like, now you don't run into a lot of people that are, well, I'm a film editor and I also do composition right. for the film. How did you get started doing composition? Well, uh, I did composition as a hobby coming out of film school. I built a little MIDI studio in the, in the late 80s or when the MIDI technology came along and I would simply stripe videotapes and uh, rescore my friend's student films. And uh, long story short, I was doing a feature with, uh, with Brian and the composer dropped out in the, in the last second and we had a deadline for Sundance, so I scored the film. And so after we, we won Sundance with that feature, uh, I said, I don't want to edit the film, I just want to write the score. And he said, hell no, you're never going to... You're never going to ed- uh, score a film for me unless you're the editor. So that's how the, the blackmail basically happened. He, he would tell the same story. So um, my music agent would often joke, like, does Tim Burton make Danny Elfman wash his car so he can score the movie? You know, He might. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, editing is hardly washing a car. It's, it's, as, even as a composer, I say that uh, there's nothing more important than the editing. I mean, you can have a film, as, as Alexander, Cor- uh, not, what's the first? Oh, Alfonso uh, Coran said, you, know, yeah. you can't have a film, you can have a film without music, you can have a film without sound even, but you can't have a film without the DP and you can't have a film without uh, the editor. So, um, but it's true. It's the core of filmmaking, you know. So we talked about how you, how you became attached to the film. This is a project that's actually been around in the industry for a while. Queen had been working on it with the producers for right. 10 years. 10 years. I wasn't, I wasn't involved in that, but um, uh, that's how long it took to get off the ground for the producer, Graham King. And, um, you know, and working with the band to try to embrace screwing with history a little bit, you know, and, and explaining to them how to make a narrative film with emotional fluidity and so forth, you have to lie a little bit in terms of telling your story. And they, they understood that after a while. And so I um, actually understood it to the degree I was shocked how much they're willing to lie at some point to accomplish the, the goals we wanted to make it an emotional, very emotional film, as, long as, as well as, you know, uh, titillating with this, the Queen music and so forth. You know? oh, so, I mean, this is, this is a real person and a real band, and it's something that is of record. What is it you have to be careful about being precious about when you say, like, I get a cheat here Well, and I, there. Think, I think that the, the bottom line was being reverential to Freddie, you know, and, and keeping the, that accurate as to who he was. Some of the events might have been switched around, but it didn't matter. To them, they were just very, they got very emotional every time they would watch the movie or talk talk about it, and so to them, it was true to Freddie, and that's, that's what mattered to them. Working in a film like this, where there's so many musical performances that are 
very dynamic, very, very elaborate. Is that much harder for you as an editor versus something like a usual suspects where it's just a straight ahead narrative? It's a different kind of difficulty. Everything is uh, difficult in a certain way, but I, I wouldn't say it was any more daunting than putting together a really difficult dialogue scene. I mean, it's more daunting, in, 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 I guess, in the respect that it, they're ma they were massive. So they were very long in length and huge. And so designing one musical sequence was its own little movie. Live Aid being the ultimate example of that that we talked about kept me up at night for a year because it was the first thing we shot. And I was called that the Death Star sequence of, of uh, Bohemian Rhapsody. So if that didn't work, it was done. The film would be a disaster. So it, it had to end in an emotional and very satisfying and cathartic way and be almost exhausting in a good way. So that was the BMF that I had to handle, you know, aside from the rest of the film and, you know, all the stuff that goes on in making a film, which is a lot of time more political than creative sometimes, you know. Were there elements of the story arc, and again, it's about being reverential to Freddie, about his life and about where the whole thing would end, in the, in, at least in the film, were there places where we're like, you know what, we, we're going to back off some of this so we can have more of that? Well, yeah, I mean, especially when you're bartering with the studio with notes and so forth, they always want to film shorter and faster, you know, and the misconception is that editors are not people that want things faster and shorter necessarily. They want more stuff in. They want to they wanna tell a story. So um, I would say more times than not, they want something in that the studio wants out, So which, which happened on this film and happens with every film. I mean, there are moments in this film I wish we could have included, like Freddy growing up in Zanzibar. That was my pet peeve, but anyway. And, and perhaps if they had kept that in, it might have been best picture. That's right. <laughs> right we were almost there. <laughs> inside joke. There are so many great performances to look at, and there's a lot of things you and I could talk about, and we will talk about, but we should actually look at some of your Yeah, work. let's watch shit. Yeah, let's watch shit. Yeah. You want to head over there and stand next to my friend okay. Michael and right. watch shit? Michael, okay. put some shit on the screen. Right, so. <laughs> okay, this, this is... Uh, their first big concert would actually, in the script and in the first cut, it was their second concert in the film. Um, I'm sorry, it is ultimately, see, I, I, I can't remember history. Anyway, this sequence was so big and celebratory that we, when we watched the film back, we realized that this should be the second concert because um, it shows that they're making it. Japan was the first concert, but we cut that out of the movie. I don't know why I'm going on about that, but anyways, it's just an example of how we switch things around and change the logic of the story, and then have to do reshoots to sort of um, to adhere to that logic. So anyway, this is um, a sequence where they're, they're, having, they're going through America, and they're, and they're going through many different venues. So you, um, when we shot this, it was all in a black room, of course. There's nothing out there except for a few uh, extras in a front row. And so all the crowds were added, and um, the venues, if you look closely, it's very fast cutting, but you'll see different balconies and different um, walls that, and at different places they're going to perform, when in reality, of course, we were always on the same stage in the black room shooting them. About three times we shot this because of different costume changes and so forth. When I was putting together the sequences, no matter how snazzy they were, they would fall flat actually when you watch the movie because uh, unless they were about something, the narrative of the film just stops. So once you light the fuse of a story and you stop it for a concert, it just doesn't feel involving. So that's why I uh, ended up in integrating uh, his phone call to Mary where he's questioning his sexuality, and then, of course, all the band call-outs to different cities. So then this became about, you know, taking America by storm and about Freddie's um, personal moments. So I found that every sequence had to be about something, otherwise you just didn't care, you know. Something like this, how challenging is it versus just like a straight-ahead dialogue I mean, scene? my initial cut probably took me three or four days, you know, but then that's just the initial cut. I mean, the first thing you do is I basically do the basic Freddie performance by taking the, the, the most amazing nuggets of Rami Malek and place them on a video tracks and just scatter them around. So now I have a, a scattered uh, little pieces of the best moments, even though the, the, the greatest moment might have been this long, the, piece, the little piece I'm putting on the, on the video track is this long. There's another great piece under that. So the agonizing decision is which one do I use? Because they're both great. And so a little bit of that one, a little bit of that one. Pretty soon you have this checkerboard that you're expanding. So that becomes Rami's performance. And then after that, you start integrating, I start, into, you know, the... Um, the other band members and then the, the venues and figuring out what is this about and then integrating the other, other imagery. You know, there's also, when any sequence like this, there's visual effects concerns because um, 
you know, every shot, even if I shoot off the stage, just a sliver off the stage can be 50 grand. So you got to blow up shots and you kind of save the money so you can get a, a big shot that you want to pay for later, you know, like in Real Rock you, you know, with the big audience shots. So that's also a consideration. Everything's a visual effect outside because we were shooting in London, had to make it look like the Midwest. But like this, uh, the Queen bus, uh, didn't have Queen on it. That's actual visual effect. It said um, it was this band they were they were supporting because um, the original storyline is they were going to America to support another band. So the van in the back that they're riding in was really shitty and beaten up. But then when we changed the storyline to have them be more, this was um, their success. We changed the um, the van. The, I mean, sorry, the, the the bus to say Queen, and we clean up the van to be more new looking. So these are the things that the macro things that happen when you're making a movie. Sometimes when you get the, uh, the actual visual effect back or the, or the rough of the visual effect and you realize it's going to be a lot better than you were imagining, a shot like this that used to be a third of this length, I suddenly was like, wow, I just want to hold on this forever. And so basically I took out a bunch of cuts and just played it out for him to you know, basically come across the stage and, and sell the, uh, the immensity of the stage. Because, um, you know, it's another conscious thing that when you're designing the sequences, every time you, you show yet just a sliver off the stage, it's 50 grand. So that was a big consideration with anything you're designing. So you blow up shots and so forth just to get the, the edge off. And, and uh, I've talked about before with digital now, you can make a, a three shot into a two shot. I was talking about the Ray Foster scenes, the ones with... Um, Mike Myers? Mike Myers, yeah. And, uh, you know, we had basically one shot with, from his point of view, which five guys lined up in an office, and it just became very static. So I could make that into a three shot, almost, almost a single if I wanted to. You can blow up so, so much now without a degradation of quality. So without going off and, and shooting a single, I could create one. So. so it seems like a lot of times now in, in editorial that they're trying to finish more in offline to create more of a cinematic experience while editing. Like a lot of editors are, are editing with 5.1 sound yeah. or the, the previous stuff gets more elaborate as they're doing editing. Is that something you're experiencing or? I, have res I, well, I always resist technology because I hate learning new things, but I, don't, I, I haven't done the 5.1 thing because I just want to deal with editing the film and, and if it's stereo, I can play it loud and I don't need to hear something going over me you know, at, that, at that point. You know, but when we test screening, I do a phony surround system where we feed stuff stuff in the surround. Even though it's all left right, there's no, no one in the center. It's a little weird, but it gets me to get more test screenings in. You know. Well, you, you, so you brought up test screenings. And that's something that's an important part of every film. How many test screenings did five? I think five. I and mean, we, we we started out strong. I mean, we had like in the 90s score was huge, but um, you know. There's always something valuable you will learn from a test screening. As we all know, they, they're, they're very valuable, but they can also be abused for people's agendas and so forth. If like three people says what this executive said clearly, what they said was right, but no, they forget there's like 500 people that didn't say that. So it's those sort of debates you have. And, and sometimes the editor's uh, job or mine if, uh, is, is to build consensus, you know. But you can learn something that's shocking in a test screening that uh, suddenly no one understands or is confused by. And so then we go, okay, now we have a problem. So they, they are very valuable, you know. So. You mentioned that eventually in the film they were supposed to be going doing a tour of Japan, right? And it just sort of fell flat. It didn't seem like it seemed like it would have been earlier in their career. It was ultimately just became a 10-second snippet in the film. Of course, I did many different iterations that made it shorter and shorter and shorter to try desperately to get it in the film because I wanted at least us to go there for a little bit of time. But it ended up being a split screen, quick montage, boom or out, and just to infer infer that they went to Japan. But Fat Bottom Girls just seemed bigger and more had bigger scope, so. Um, it was decided that that would be where they made it, and this one be, would be talked about. You made a big case about, with Fat Bottom Girl Sequence, there was still, you were driving the narrative in the thing. That's right, that's and, true. And here, that didn't happen. It really was just a self-contained... that's probably why it also felt flat when we had it in the cut, because it really wasn't telling any other story, but we're having a cool concert in Japan, and people are loving us. That, that was it. So there was no other subtext to it at all, yeah. So another scene that we had talked about earlier was um, the evolution of We Will Rock You. Yeah, We Will Rock You actually is, is the, um, the story in that one is pretty simple. It's just about engaging the audience. So this was the one where I had to do the least amount of infusing a story from the movie because this concert was about the idea of Brian May to, to include the audience more. One of the hardest parts though is when you're feverishly trying to cut a sequence together, you do it, and then two months later comes more footage that was supposed to potentially could go in, or they don't ask you to do that, but then I realize, oh, the stuff in the studio where they're talking should be integrated into 
the concert, that would be cool. So you basically throw a grenade into your own work. But you know, if you're really being objective and not trying to be defensive of your own work, you have to open up and understand that it can be better when new footage comes in. So, um, and it did make it better. And another example would be foot stomping. I always had a, 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 some slugs for the foot stomping because the second unit had not gone out and shot that yet. So then that kind of, your game plan gets altered. So because I'm obsessed with how editors start a sequence like in something like this, do you just like, okay, I'm gonna do, just do the, the, the concert and then just start dropping in the... Yeah, you know. that's what happened, because uh, the studio stuff hadn't been shot yet. You know, and I was really, I was really obsessed with the, you know, using the little flashes of light not to see Freddy and kind of keep him obscured, you know. And that took forever, but then when the, when, the, uh, when the earlier, when the stuff in the studio came in, I was like, oh my God, I have to, I have to, in, I have to in, infuse this stuff, you know. So then it became even more fun. Did you end up stealing a lot of bits from you know, different performances? Like, okay, this was originally supposed to be part of Japan, and now I'm going to make it over here? Or? No, because the cost of me and so forth will be different. But uh, I did often, of course, cheat. Uh, if the lyrics were repeated in a, in a song, I would sometimes take a better take from the previous part and cheat it for the, the back part. You know? Or you can, actually, you can actually cheat performances on the... I think in Live Aid, we, we, had, uh, didn't have, we had limited coverage of, um, of, the, of, of close-ups of the band on stage, and we did shoot some pickups, but we didn't shoot all the songs. So later, you know, I would fake it, you know, to, like these, you know, just basically showing a headshot going like that. It clearly, it actually was playing a different song, you know, so things like that. And then when I did the extended Live Aid for the DVD, which was the whole 20-minute set, um, I had to do a lot of faking, you know. So, and that's a really cool sequence to watch because I had to cut out I mean, the, the, the Live Aid in the movie is 13 minutes, but the, there's a 20-minute Live Aid on the, that's on part of the uh, DVD or download, whatever, yeah. With all these story changes that take place, are there certain techniques that you use or certain methods you use to just keep organized? Or, you know, memory is a, is a fallible thing, and, you know, you've got to figure out, like, okay, wait a minute, all of a sudden that bus shouldn't say that anymore, or the, yeah, the band concert... Hell, I already forgot about that, but, um, no, I mean, when you're, in the, when, you're in, when you're in the throes of making a film, at least for me, I, I have a, uh, like, an insane memory for that. I don't have any memory of what I did yesterday or where I ate, and, you know, I don't know any of that stuff. I don't care. Just tell me where we're going to go. You know what I mean? But when you're in your job, it's a, you're a whole different person. So, and I, I have a... I won't say it's a photographic memory, but I think it's pretty... I, I remember everything, because uh, from the old days where you couldn't... You, you didn't have little markers. You had to remember everything you looked at on the film. And, um, and I, that's how I trained my brain to work. Yeah. So I, the uh, audio team, who is also here with us today, did me a favor. They, they left some notes about the stuff. That I didn't even see this before. They have notes here. It says, Bo Rap Studio Guitar. Probably my favorite sequence in the film. Live Aid is, but it gives me post-traumatic stress disorder. <laughs> so um, putting together Bo Rap in the Barn is, was, is sort of a, when, when, when uh, actors go off the script, it's a blessing and it's a curse because you, you get these amazing moments, especially when there's chemistry be among the actors and um, they react to each other naturally and, or they don't react because they're not there when one gives an off-the-cuff joke on, on his side of the camera. So you fake it with a wild line you go get or over-the-shoulder stuff. And so basically what I would do is I would take all the, um, the improv moments of the scene and script them out in the editing room and sort of create a new logic to it because I wanted to keep all of it, you know, because that's what made it real. And then when I realized the scene was really coming together and was going to be great, I was already pissed off because I assumed someone's going to wreck it, you know. So I do that when I write music also. When I realize I'm writing something really good, I write in anger because I know <laughs> someone's going to screw it up later. But, um, uh, you know, through test screenings or studio notes or whatever, someone's going to throw a grenade in. But this one, um, I, I protected like a, a, a mother would her child. And, um, but we, when we did the test screenings, um, the audience loved the sequence so much that we didn't change it to frame from this, this which, which was the original assembly. And so that's one of, why it's one of my favorite sequences, you know. Yeah. So what was it about that sequence for you as an editor that you really appreciate it? I guess camaraderie among the characters, you know. I mean, you know, and the back and forth and doing the sound work and the telephone filtering and the, you know, the PA and the, it, it's just, uh, there's just so much going on in the scene. Yeah. Well, speaking of camaraderie and, and editors, we're going to have the sound team out here very soon, as I said. Um, they're going to take a look at this scene as well. It's much more complicated than it might appear, so we're going to get into that. Um, but before we do, I want you to join me in thanking John for being here today to share this with us. Thank you, John Ottman. Yeah. Would you please welcome to the stage Nina Hartstone, Paul Massey, and John Warhurst from Bohemian Rhapsody. Thank you. 
in a lot of these sessions we've done, we sort of tee things up by talking about your roles in the film and in your, in your careers in general and what you do to make something like this happen. And so, John Warhurst, what is your title and what do you do? So I'm the supervising sound and music editor, which means that I sort of uh, started the film as on a more sort of music editorial basis, uh, preparing all the tracks and everything that we play back on set. But once we actually got to the shoot, I, I was looking on set all the time for opportunities as to how we can start to record the sound, collect sound that we're going to need for the final mix. And then sort of uh, moving forward for that, getting everything together to the cut that John Ottman had done and preparing it for the final mix for when Paul took over mixing. And Ms. Hearthstone, what does a dialogue and ADR supervisor do? So my role on the film is I take the sound that's been recorded on set. I start off with the avid audio that John Ottman has cut together and then I demultiplex the mics so that I can access all of the recordings that have been made on set. Obviously it's primarily dialogue. I go through, I cut that together, try and make it sound good, identify anything that needs to be re-recorded as ADR. But also on this film, because it's a musical film, I got to cut the vocals as well, which felt like quite a privilege, I have to admit. Considering whose vocals they were, that must have been... Uh, listening to Freddie's vocal on its own, I, I'll never get over that. And Paul Massey, tell us about yourself, sir. So I was the uh, music mixer and also the uh, dialogue and music re-recording mixer in the final mix. And as the music mixer, I had access to all of the archived material that had been prepared from Queen. We had amazing collaboration from Queen and their engineers, and, and everything was presented to me in multi-track format, so I was able to access all of the dry individual recordings from um, all of their live shows, all of their studio recordings, everything we needed. And then as a final mixer, as a re-recording mixer, I was dealing with the tracks that Nina had prepared for Dialogue, ADR, and Group. Did some pre-mixing on that and brought all of those elements to the final mix, and we started to work together as a team, putting the final soundtrack together. So it's pretty commonplace working on a film to be getting notes from directors, producers, the studio. In this case, you're also getting notes from the people that are in the film. You're getting notes from Brian May and Roger Taylor. What kind of pressure does that put on you as a sound professional to be getting notes and, and having discussions with Brian May? I mean, I was terrified. when I, I was really looking forward to meeting Brian and, and Roger. And of course, I didn't really want to do it before I'd started mixing some of the music. I didn't want them to walk in and, and be there on minute one, and I haven't got anything prepared yet. But um, the terrifying part of that was that they did show up on the second day of music mixing for me. I had six days to essentially quickly rush through all of the music multitracks, try to get them about 70% prepped. And they decided that they wanted to come in, which was great, but I had to make all these excuses as to why it sounded like it did, and we didn't have any crowds yet, and we didn't have the effects, and we, it wasn't anywhere close to a final mix, and that was nerve-wracking. But they were wonderful. They were incredibly collaborative. They understood very much what was going on, and uh, they were a joy to work with throughout the whole process. Now, Nina, for you, Again, you talked about having Freddie Mercury's vocals to work with, mm -hmm. but that alone wouldn't have been enough to accomplish all the things you needed to accomplish in the movie to fulfill the needs of the script. How did you ultimately create Freddie's vocals for the film? Well, basically, obviously, Rami Malek, uh, as our lead actor playing Freddie, he did all the spoken word, all the acting in the film. But when it came to the sung pieces, we wanted to use Freddie Mercury's iconic voice as much as we possibly could. So if there were any recordings that we could use provided by Queen uh, of Freddie's vocal, we obviously used them. There are a few elements, obviously, story-wise in the film where it's not concert footage. We didn't have pre-records from Freddie. So we had to use a Freddie Mercury sound-alike, a voice like a guy called Mark Martell, who sounds very much much like Freddie Mercury, did a really good job. But my challenge on Pro Tools editorially was to basically use Rami's voice, Freddie Mercury's voice, and Mark Martel's voice, and try and make them all feel like they were coming out of Rami's mouth the entire journey of the film, and always felt like one person. That was obviously quite a tricky thing to do, and I ended up having to use quite a lot of Rami's breaths and lip smacks and mic blows and stuff during concert footage and weaving it in and out of Freddie's vocal or Mark Martell's vocal just to really pin that voice into his mouth so that there was never a point in the film where you questioned the voice that was coming out of our lead actor. Because there's always a constant balance between the visual performance, the visual editing, and then the dialogue and the lip sync. Do you find that you had to make compromises in certain places and work things out with John and that the best edit is this, but the lip sync's going to be a little off there? Does that happen? Yeah, well, we, we certainly I work very closely with John, both Johns actually, with John Altman and John Warhurst here. And we just we sort of bounced it back and forth. So it would go from sort of what fit best in terms of the vocal, in terms of Rami's performance, and then checking how that 
then worked with the musical track and then also seeing how that worked with the edit. So we did go around the houses a little bit, bouncing things back and forth until we found the absolute sweet spot to get everything as perfect as it could be for every single shot. So John, for you, this had to be a really challenging project. What did you do when you were first handed this script and sort of the breakdown of like, okay, this is what we're going to need for this film. Did you just take a deep, deep breath and go, how am I going to do this? Yeah, one of the biggest things that bothered me about the film was obviously the film ended with Live Aid. And I knew from doing sort of other concert films that although you can have microphones that are on the audience, you can't actually turn those microphones up because all you get when you turn them up is actually just the slap of the PA. And you don't really get any, you can't, and it destroys the music mix. So we got handed the shooting schedule. I remember sort of thumbing through the schedule, trying to find out where there'd be good places and we could try and record some of the, the, the crowds that they had. And there was a one second unit shoot day where they had uh, 600 people showing up. So I, I knew, I, I emailed the line producer and said, would there be any chance that we could ask them to sing along to some of the crowds and we could record the, the crowds. So uh, yeah, it was, it was a question of go, literally going through the, all the schedule and trying to find out how we can gather the sound. And that was one of the great things about starting the film before the shoot was it meant I could look at the whole shoot and try and find those opportunities. So this film is all about iconic music. Right from Fade Up, the first thing you run into is the Fox anthem or open or logo or whatever, fanfare, whatever you want to call it. And you guys decided, or Brian May decided, we're not going to just go with the standard Fox anthem. Yeah, that was Brian May's idea. He wanted to re-record the Fox logo with his guitars, and he, he, did, he ended up using 64 different guitars and re-recorded the whole thing. It starts off like you're thinking, oh, that's, that's the Fox logo. And then it starts to turn and morph into something else. And during the process, he has a very, very scientific mind. And so we were, mixing in, we were mixing natively in Dolby Atmos, and he saw the video monitor that showed all of the object balls bouncing around the room with different panning on it, and he wanted to know exactly what I was doing there, why I was assigning certain things to that corner of the room and back there, and what does that all mean, and what happens when you solo those, and what if we repan that one, and we ended up spending 20 hours on the Fox logo, which lasts, I don't know how many seconds that was. But throughout the entire mix, we kept revisiting it because he had other ideas and then he wanted to add other guitars to it. And we just, it evolved into what came out in the film, obviously, but we thought it would be just a, you know, a, an hour in the studio in the final mix. And we ended up taking two days. Did you ever say, Brian, you know, I got a lot of work to get to. Could we sort of stop at 20 guitars? Do you think that would cut it? Uh, no, he presented it as 64 guitars, but... Um, he is very analytical. Is there a mathematical reason why it had to be 64? I'm 64? sure there was. It could, probably couldn't be 67. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> so these actors are not musicians, per se, or by trade. Obviously, you're trying to get them to look and, and act like the you know, real musicians like Brian and Roger. How did you accomplish that? How did you work with them to make it as realistic as possible? Well, certainly, uh, say, Ben Hardy, who plays Roger Taylor, he, I think he said in his interview that he did play drums, but I think it <laughs> trans came to light later. He'd actually probably just sat behind a drum kit once or twice. And so once he got the part, he actually then started, he got a, a drum coach, and he spent about two months uh, playing drums solidly to try and uh, learn all those drum fills and the, and the parts. Certainly, uh, Gwillem, I think, could strum a few chords, and that Joe had never played bass in his life. And um, obviously Rami, he could sing okay, but he certainly couldn't dance like Freddie. So he had to, he was uh, spent months doing, uh, learning all the, all the different moves and trying to become Freddie, watching, watching a lot of his live performances and working out how he walks on stage, how he moves and things like that. So there was a lot of uh, coaching went into that. You're integrating dialogue and music. What is the interchange between you, John, and Nina, where, like, did you do the music first, then it hits over to Nina and she takes care of the dialogue bits, or how does that interop happen? Well, um, I, th I think we'd, we'd, we found all, all the sort of the parts of the vocal, and then once, once we had the vocal and we had the picture, then I would just hand over the uh, Freddie's separate vocal to Nina for her to sort of literally uh, work on it as if it was a piece of ADR that needed to be fitted to that performance. Then. So then, yeah, I'd cut it as, and, as tight as it possibly could be fitted, adding in any of uh, Rami's breaths and things to try and pin it in even more. And then we'd check it against the music. John and I would look at it together and see if it was still musical. And then... Then when you'd send it back sometimes, we, we'd then play that vocal back against the music and think, wow, I don't think Freddie would have ever sung it like that really. It sounds a bit out of time now. We, so then we wanted to restore Freddie's original performance and that meant moving the picture. So that's when we needed to get in touch with Mr. Altman, who you saw earlier. And we, we would ask him to roll shots 
uh, literally one off, two frames, three frames, to restore that entire cut so that we could keep Freddie's original performance the way it was, but the, so that the picture was absolutely in sync with it. Speaking of sync and speeding things up, I think it was We Will Rock You, when they play live, it's faster than what's in the film. Is that, yes. is that am I thinking of the right one? Or is yeah, no, that, that, that's true. Uh, when, because, because of the way the script read, that song, uh, Brian, he sort of explained to us that the way, when they came up with that song, they wanted it to be uh, a song for the audience. They wanted the, it, to, it to be something the audience could join in with. And so he, he kind of came up with this stomp, stomp, clap idea. And he actually came up with that in a studio. And so he, they wanted to illustrate in the film how Brian came up with the song and he was showing the rest of the band to do the stomp, stomp, clap. But then they wanted to intercut it with live. Now, if you ever hear Queen playing We Will Rock You Live, you'll always hear them playing it much faster than they ever play it in the movie. But because we wanted to cut from studio to live to studio to live, then we had to decide to do the live parts at the same tempo as the studio parts. Otherwise, it wouldn't make sense to keep going to a fast to slow to fast to slow. So this is the only time you'll ever hear a Queen live version of We Will Rock You at the studio tempo. As we go through all these different elements of the session, it just becomes clear just how many layers, how many pieces, how many voices, how many instruments. Again, even three voices to create one voice, just how massive this is. And Paul, for you, I seem to recall you saying that you tended to lean away from relying on digital things, relying on plugins, and really being more organic and how you created sounds, how you created even reverb, things like that. Is that the case, and what was your approach? Yeah, on this, uh, very early on, I, I realized that you know, we'd have the usual array of plugins and reverbs and delays that we could use, but I also wanted to get the actual sound of a stadium as part of this movie so that the audience would feel even more like it was a real performance, especially during the Live Aid sequence. So we went through a couple of places where we could record and various reasons we couldn't do it. But I wanted to get the sound of the music playing in a large environment through a PA at very high level. And we found out that Queen uh, were playing at the O2 Stadium in London, which is about a 20,000 seat indoor arena. And we managed to get a couple of hours of time with no audience in there and played all of the songs that we need for the film that were going to be uh, situated in auditoriums or stadium settings uh, and played that through the concert PA at full level and mic'd all around the arena up in the rafters and down on the stage level and back looking, looking at the audience and such with 22 different mics. And then we took that collectively. It got edited down as the songs got edited down and I essentially used it as reverb returns during the final mix so that it would give me the real sound of a huge stadium and how that would respond so that we could make the perspectives true to the film, to each shot. It was very important to me that the audience feel like when we were on the stage, we had, you know, we're close to, the, to Brian's guitar, we could actually accent his guitar and when we're next to Roger's cymbals we could highlight his cymbals and coincidentally when we're at the back of the stadium I wanted to be able to push the band back and have the sound of that stadium be the the uh, overriding part of the final mix that the audience is, is listening to. So we used the regular sort of delays and reverbs that we would reach for anyway but also had that at, at my disposal. I should also add too I put that all of those 22 mics uh, in the pattern they were recorded in the O2 stadium like up high in the rafters at the back or down at the front and such, into objects in the Dolby Atmos mix, and was able to really get the height and the breadth and the depth of a stadium experience, because it truly was a stadium experience. So the crowds that we were talking about, the ones that we recorded, we sort of looped them over and over again. There were the 600 people that we managed to loop over and over again. And then we, we actually did, we did go to some plugins. We used um, Avox uh, Choir, we used Altiverb, we used Spanner, things like that, to try and make those, what amounts to about 1,800 people, sort of turn into, uh, hopefully, close to 90,000. So. You get that? Then we have the, the slap of the... Um, this is the recording that we did at the O2, which has got the... Which is completely separate to the music. So that means between having the, 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 the ambience of the, of the stadium and the crowds and then the, the music separate, that meant that Paul could actually completely mix them. 
to get the perspective shifts on the, on the stadium. The, the, the idea was, was that wherever the camera was in the stadium, you would always be able to feel where you were in the stadium. So, so as, as the camera would rove around, whether, whether you'd be on stage with the band or whether you'd be at the back of the stadium, because we had the independent control, because Paul had all the independent control, it meant that you could actually change the perspective. So wherever you were with the camera, you always felt you were watching the, you were experiencing Live Aid from that angle. If you, if you want to explain about the, the, I was, the perspective. I was just going to say, it was so vital for us to have in the final mix, not all of the dry instrumentation, obviously, so we could create the perspectives and the balance that we needed there. And then the sound of the stadium, the O2 stadium, so we could get the depth of Wembley Stadium, but also to have the singing crowd completely separate from music, so that we could really push into that and not take away the power of the direct signal of the, of the band and keep the drive going all the way through. We could, we could add a ton of crowd singing and, and the band would still remain as strong as, as if they were soloed. Yeah, and there was, um, the, we also, the way that we, we did the crowd, we did sort of as three, three levels of crowd. So we did this, the, the bigger crowd, which is the sort of, the, the 600 crowd that we managed to record on set, and then Nina did uh, some more medium-sized crowds down at Shepparton. Yeah, uh, so our loop group, we got about 40 people in, and I, again, I, I wanted to record it in, in an environment that felt true to the Live Aid Stadium. So we went to Shepparton on a weekend and did it exterior, and, and again, similar to the O2, we had eight mics, and we placed them around at various different distances uh, and got the crowd. So for the smaller pockets, when you, when you kind of dive into the crowd, you can hear slightly more individual voices voices we recorded uh people in, in groups of eight but we had sort of 40 of them so we got a variety of voices and then we did all the spots as well so on any of those shots where there's a, a lump of people you kind of there's always a three or four who catch their eye you've got a big wide open mouth doing something specific so we had them doing it shouting everything shouting that all the band's names freddie brian roger wow woo every vowel you could think of so that we always had had a vast library of excited concert shouts to put in anybody's mouth we saw at any point. I have to ask whether it's ever out of necessity or out of a sense of mischief. Did you ever put your own voices in there or have a friend in there coming there, Freddie? <laughs> I tried very hard not to put my voices. I've, I've mimed this song so many times. <laughs> I, think, I think John Ottman did have oh, a friend yeah. he, who sent us a Freddie, uh, the most ecstatic Freddie, and said, could, he pl could we please put him in the movie? And we did. He's and in I, there somewhere. There's, there's, there's there. a shot of one guy, pretty much. Camera dumps comes down almost on one person on the audience. That's John Ottman's friend shouting out, Freddie. <laughs> Good to know John Ottman. Um, it was an amazing film. You guys have done some great presentations with us here this week. I can't thank you enough for, for joining us and doing all this. And I'd like to ask all of you to help me in congratulating them and thanking them for being here today. Uh, John, Nina, and Paul, thank you very much. Thank you. We'd like to say thanks to Matt as well for having yeah, us here and for being such yeah. a brilliant host. It's been great. Oh. Oh, I forgot that Nina gave me that little shout out there at the end. That was very sweet. She is the best. They were all the best. And I cannot wait to do something like that event again someday. And hopefully when I do, maybe you can be there. That would be really cool. Please join me in thanking John, Nina, Paul, and John for sharing their experience and incredible talents with us on this podcast. If you would like to make the most of your incredible talents, be they as picture editor, sound editor, or sound mixer, I can tell you that Avid has some pretty cool creative tools for you and they get better every month. So make sure you are up on all the latest with Avid Media Composer and Avid Pro Tools. Yes, the same nonlinear editing system and digital audio workstation that the folks from Bohemian Rhapsody used to bring home Oscar Gold. What a name that would be, Oscar Gold. Got to remember that one. I will put a link in the show notes to the latest special offers available for both these products, and I think there's actually a pretty good deal right now with 20% off a new one-year subscription for Media Composer Ultimate. So make sure to check that out. All right, I hope you enjoyed this throwback episode. Let me know what you think about digging into the archives every now and then. If you are good with it, I will do it when I can. For now, though, it's time to wrap things up. Until we meet again, this is Mad Fury thanking you for joining me right here on The Rough Cut. Rough Cut.